All right, the top 25 movies of 2021. I just spilled this all over myself. What's going on everybody? In my hand, I have my list of my top 25 movies of 2021. And I've also got my phone right here with IMDB open because I can't remember everything. A lot of the movies that got delayed during 2020 because of the pandemic came out in 2021. So we kind of got like double the movies and there was a lot of good ones. But unfortunately my time is limited and I haven't seen every single movie that came out. So my apologies if your favorite movie isn't on this list. This list is my opinion. And if you don't agree with it or your list is completely different that is totally okay we are more than welcome to discuss your list in the comments but enough chit chat let's get right into it my top 25 movies of 2021 number 25 old. Now I'm a big fan of M. Night Shyamalan and he's definitely had some hits and misses and not everybody seemed to like old as much as I did but I thought it was a mostly original idea and while M. Night Shyamalan seems to have his movies judged by how good his twist endings are I thought the twist ending for this one while not amazing was intriguing and interesting enough to make it all make sense. Some of the dialogue in this movie isn't the greatest but it was just enough for me to enjoy this Twilight Zone like episode of a movie. I think it's worth a watch. Number 24. Rat of man. Also a big fan of Guy Ritchie. I was a really big fan of The Gentleman and I was surprised that his follow-up movie wasn't talked about as much. Now while it is more formulaic than most of his films and I do have to admit it doesn't have his usual style, I thought it was a fun movie and an interesting take on the whole LA armored truck heist concept. I thought Jason Statham was pretty good in this and we also got one of my favorite performances from Scott Eastwood as a villain. Oh and we also get to see Post Malone do some acting in this one. Number 23, Nobody. From the same director of Hardcore Henry comes an action-packed John Wick meets Home Alone style film, which also includes a much more physical performance from Bob Odenkirk than I was expecting. Bob Odenkirk can beat some ass. This movie was a lot more gory than I expected. And while it's a much less serious film, it's more ridiculous and kind of played as a dark comedy, I was pleasantly surprised and it made my list. Number 22, now this one might get a little bit of criticism, but The Guilty, starring Jake Gyllenhaal is a remake of a Russian film, I believe, where he plays a dispatcher. Most of the film is spent with Jake Gyllenhaal by himself talking on a phone with people over 911 calls. I had a lot of fun with it. I thought Jake Gyllenhaal's performance was top notch. And also, since it was filmed during COVID, the director actually spent most of his time directing Jake Gyllenhaal and the other actors from a van outside, like across the street. And watching this movie, I would have had no clue. This was another one of those Netflix films I went into with somewhat low expectations and ended up enjoying it a lot more than I expected to. Number 21, Stillwater. Now, this is not a huge action-packed film. It's got a lot of talking, but it's got one of my favorite Matt Damon performances to this date. I believe it takes place in France, and it's about a father trying to track down the person who framed his daughter for murdering her girlfriend. And there's some very emotional performances in this movie. It definitely tugged at my heartstrings. It's a very realistic film, and it's actually inspired by a true story. And with all the films that came out this last year, I think this one really flew under the radar. I would honestly consider this one a hidden gem. Number 20, Cruella. Hair and makeup on point in this film. I guess the best way I could describe Cruella is like the Devil Wears Prada meets Joker because Emma Stone gives this performance that really kind of surprised me. She was good at playing this almost like crazy character. I mean, she's kind of crazy, but I was honestly impressed. It was like a switch flipped at one point in this film and she was Cruella. And I think it going straight to Disney Plus kind of made the film suck suffer a little bit, but I went into it not really expecting to like it as much as I did, and I think it's a solid film. Number 19, The King's Man. I love the first Kingsman. I also love Matthew Vaughn's way of directing action. I think he's one of the best directors when it comes to fight scenes, and the second Kingsman movie was kind of a letdown. I, something about it just didn't feel right, and it just didn't really live up to that first film. This movie feels like three different stories put together. I'm on board. I, I like where they went with this story, and I totally believe that the Kingsman is an organization that was formed because some bad shit happened and they don't want anything like that to ever happen again. This movie was a lot of fun, top-notch acting, and I would honestly be interested in seeing a follow-up to this one. Number 18, No Time to Die. I'm not the craziest James Bond fan, and No Time to Die is better than Spectre, but not as good as Casino Royale, and definitely not as good as Skyfall. But, spoiler alert, they killed James Bond. And that was something that I wasn't sure if they were gonna have the guts to do or not. And while I think this 
particular film came a little too late. I still think it's a really good movie. Number 17, Ron's Gone Wrong. It's a solid ass family film. I was impressed and a little shocked when I found out that Zach Galifianakis actually voices Ron. This movie's got heart and being somebody who does so much with social media, I definitely get the messages that it's trying to communicate. And I hope they don't make a sequel. I am totally fine with this just being a one-off and it exceeded my expectations. So it's on this list. Number 16. King Richard. Will Smith steals the show in this movie. One of his best performances, but also it's about tennis and I don't know anything about tennis. Tennis doesn't really interest me, but I found myself very intrigued and interested in this story. It's a solid film all around and that's why it's on my list. Number 15. This one kind of rubs me weird, but I really enjoyed it. Licorice Pizza. I'm a big fan of Paul Thomas Anderson, but I love how this movie feels like we're just kind of peering into these people's lives for a little bit. It's a pretty straightforward story and I know some people might argue that it just feels like a Bunch of scenes put together but it's my type of humor and there is a small role that Bradley Cooper has in this film and he just killed it I was dying the whole entire time he was on the screen and honestly Bradley Cooper might be the main reason why it's on this list but I gotta admit the thing that really irks me is that this movie is about like a 15 year old kid falling in love with some 22 year old woman but besides that weird little factor I enjoyed this movie and that's why it's on my list number 14 Nightmare Alley speaking of Bradley Cooper. He was in a Guillermo del Toro movie. And I love how Guillermo del Toro's movies feel like fairy tales. And that's exactly what this movie feels like to me. And while it's not one of del Toro's bests, I definitely got the message in this one and I definitely left it feeling a little unnerved. And I think that's exactly what it was supposed to do. Solid performances all around. Very wonderful cinematography as always. Not one of del Toro's bests, but I still thoroughly enjoyed it. Number 13, The Power of the Dog. Up until the end of this movie, I wasn't really sure how to feel about it. And I do not want to spoil it because the ending makes this movie a completely different beast. But Benedict Cumberbatch is amazing in this. The cinematography in this film is beautiful. It's one of those movies that I don't want to watch again anytime soon. But knowing the ending, it was totally worth the watch. And it's one of the most unique films I've seen in quite some time. It's definitely a slow burn, but I promise if you haven't seen it, when it's over, you're gonna sit there and just be like, whoa. Number 12, Tick Tick Boom. It turns out Andrew Garfield can sing. And one thing I've noticed with actors is that you get the best performances when the actor is very passionate about the story or whose story they're telling. And this movie being based off a real person, you can see that Andrew Garfield really wanted to do this person justice. I don't like musicals, but I found myself really enjoying some of the music in this film. It's a very heartbreaking story. And even if you don't like musicals, I highly suggest you give it a watch. Number 11, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Now, Mar Marvel seems to have an issue when it comes to introducing new characters into the MCU, but Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings is probably one of the most solid introductory films when it comes to bringing new characters into this universe. The action was awesome, the actors were awesome, there's a lot of moving pieces when it comes to the MCU. And when those pieces fall into place, you get something special. And that's definitely what we got with this film. And if you have not seen Shang-Chi and you've got Disney+, Plus, what the hell are you doing? Go watch that movie. Alright, we've made it to the top ten. These are the big, big hitters, baby. These are the ones that really, really brought the heat. But before I go through my top 10, I gotta plug G Feel Code Danny D, baby. Ah. I'm drinking some radioactive lemonade sparkling hydration because it's 1030 at night right now and I'm not trying to have caffeine. But G Feel Code Danny D is 10 to 30% off at gfeel.com. Using that code saves you some dinero and also supports videos like this and allows me to keep making content for a living. And if you've never had G Feel before, I highly suggest you check out some of my G Feel reviews. There's a ton of them and there's something for everybody. And if you decide to pull the trigger on some G Feel and you use code Danny D, post it on Instagram or Twitter. I love to see that stuff and I also like to follow people back for doing that. I really appreciate it. Now let's get into the top 10. Number 10, West Side Story. Again, not a huge fan of musicals, but this is basically a perfect ass film. And not only that, it just shows that Steven Spielberg can literally make any type of movie. This is his first musical and it's probably one of the best movies he's made in quite some time. Solid performances, solid singing, pays homage to the original musical. And it's one of those movies, when I heard it was coming out, I was like, do we really need that? But the answer is yes, because 
Steven Spielberg found a way to improve upon the original and make something that felt special and again, like Guillermo del Toro, gave it this fairy tale like feel. I believe it's available on HBO Max and I highly suggest you give it a watch. Number nine, the Fear Street trilogy. This one really, really surprised me and I decided to just clump them all into one because all three of the films are solid as hell. It's a fun spin on the slasher concept and I believe it might be based on some Arl Stein books. I feel like the first one is kind of like Scream or at least gives those kind of slasher vibes. The second one takes place in the 80s. We get this Friday the 13th type vibe. The third one takes place in the 1600s and right away I was kind of turned off by that but it ties the whole story up together in a nice little bow and I cannot wait to see what other projects come from the makers of this trilogy. I also heard the people who made this trilogy are from like YouTube or something so if that's true it could for you. That's awesome. Number eight, A Quiet Place 2. This was one of those movies that every time it got delayed, I was like, oh, just give it to us, please. The first one was so good, and it was such a solid directing debut from John Krasinski, and I was very curious to see if he could strike gold twice. And it turns out he can, because A Quiet Place 2 is a very, very solid sequel. I found myself on the edge of my seat the whole entire time, and Cillian Murphy's performance in this movie, so good. And he played that character so well that I honestly found myself questioning whether he was a good guy or not until the end of the movie. Now I heard John Krasinski's not directing the third one and that kind of worries me a bit and even if the third one is not as good these first two movies are very solid and it's pretty rare for a sequel to be as good as the first one. Number seven, Don't Look Up. Again, Netflix is starting to make good movies. I'm a big fan of Adam McKay. He has a way of sprinkling in improv into his movies that just give it this one-of-a-kind feel and it makes them that much more funnier and believable and while this is not my favorite film of his and it's very very satirical. I enjoyed the hell out of this movie. I thought the acting from everybody in this film was top notch. Leonardo DiCaprio killing it as always, but to see him in a comedic film is a rare thing. And I think a lot of people are on the fence about this movie just because of the message behind it and how it's basically calling us all idiots and making fun of politics. But when I was watching this movie, I was wondering if they were going to have the balls to do what they do at the end of this film, and I don't think they could have done it any better. And not only that, but if they didn't stick the landing, I think it probably would have made the movie a lot more forgettable. And because they stuck the landing, it made it on this list. Number six, Ghostbusters Afterlife. I anticipated the hell out of this movie. The first Ghostbusters is amazing, and the second one is a sequel. But when I found out that the son of the original director of the first two was making this, I was very curious. And this movie has a lot of heart. And there was a choice that they made in this movie that could have been a dumpster fire, but the way that they handled it. Ghostbusters 3 was in developmental hell for decades. And the Ghostbusters we got in 2016, we're just gonna pretend like that didn't happen. But when Harold Ramis passed away, I questioned whether they were ever gonna be able to do another sequel with the original cast involved that was able to pay tribute without seeming like a straight up cash grab and I'm very happy to say that this movie handled the passing of Harold Ramis in such a beautiful way that any flaws this movie has I don't care and McKenna Grace is definitely a young actress that is going to be winning a lot of awards in her future oh and Paul Rudd I mean come on who doesn't like Paul Rudd just a delightful film and R.I.P. Harold Ramis number five free guy I love Ryan Reynolds, but when I saw the trailer for this movie, I was on the fence. It looked solid, but as we all know, they can make a great trailer for a turd of a movie. And so I went into this one with low expectations and had a blast. Now I know it's not based off a particular video game IP, but it does have so much to do with video games that I dare to say it's one of the best video game related movies we've gotten. And I'm very curious to see what they do with the sequel. Great family movie, just an all around good time. And if you haven't watched it yet, it's available on Disney+. Plus. Number four, The Suicide Squad. Oh man, this movie was fun to watch. I love James Gunn and his type of humor and how he just doesn't hold anything back. And after the first Suicide Squad, I think everybody went into it with low expectations or at least lower expectations than they would have if that first movie didn't exist. But The Suicide Squad is awesome. It's an R-rated fun time. And it also introduced us to John Cena's Peacemaker, which if you haven't seen that show, highly suggest you do. And one thing that James Gunn does is he always finds a way to tug at your heartstrings and then immediately remind you that it's a James Gunn movie. Can't wait to see what they do if they make a sequel. Number three, Zack Snyder's Justice League. Now, this movie holds a special place in my heart. I'm a 26-year-old man, and that means that I don't get to watch a 
whole lot of movies with my parents anymore. But this movie came out right around the time that my parents came to visit. And my dad is very picky when it comes to movies. You could literally watch a masterpiece of a film and my dad would be like, it was all right. Everything is just all right. And I remember when we sat down to watch this movie, my dad was like, it's how long? Maybe we'll just watch the first half and then we'll watch the other half tomorrow. We didn't leave that couch until the movie was done. And say what you want about Man of Steel, say what you want about Batman versus Superman, but Zack Snyder's Justice League is a damn good epic superhero story and one of my favorite movie moments from this last year was that flash scene i remember my dad and i realizing what was happening when the flash had his little moment towards the end and we just looked at each other and said no way and when that movie was over, I asked my dad, what'd you think? And he said, it was pretty good. I don't know if we'll get any more Snyderverse films. I know there's a big movement, you know, restore the Snyderverse. And I'm totally on board with that. But if it doesn't happen, there's not a lot of movies I get to watch with my dad that we both walk away, both saying that we had a great time. And that's a special thing. Thank you, Zack Snyder. Number two, Spider-Man No Way Home. Now, I know a lot of people were probably wondering where this one was gonna be at on my list. And if you're a big movie fan, I think you know which one is number one now. But Spider-Man No Way Home is, again, a special experience. It's a culmination of childhood memories. And I remember first seeing Tobey Maguire as Spider-Man. That was right around the time that I started to be able to really remember movies. And so Spider-Man's always had a special place in my heart. And to see Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, and Tom Holland all all playing their own unique Spider-Man on screen together is the reason why I love movies. And they totally could have messed that up. When movies do things just to please the fans, sometimes it can come off as a gimmick, but this movie was able to do it in a way that felt right. And those three actors playing Spider-Man together on screen at the same time felt like movie magic. No one knows at this point in time whether we're gonna see them on screen together at the same time again. But if we don't, that's okay because it felt like it mattered, and I'm worried that if they abuse it, it'll lose that charm. And people debate, you know, who's the best Spider-Man, this and that. Tobey Maguire is always gonna be the first Spider-Man to me, and I loved Andrew Garfield's take on it. But Tom Holland's Spider-Man really feels like a Spider-Man that's learned from these two. And so it gets me so excited to see what they do with Tom Holland's Spider-Man in the future. And who knows what else is gonna come. I'm very excited for Doctor Strange 2, because I think we'll get a little bit more of the stuff that we had in this movie but damn what a good time and now we have arrived at my number one movie of 2021 and before I reveal it I just want to say thanks for watching if you like videos like this you want to see more of them definitely click like if you haven't subscribed feel free to do so now it's free and we've also got some new Danny Dorito 23 merch unfortunately I'm not wearing some right now but if you were looking for another way to support my content be sure to check out that merch link in the description all right number one my favorite movie of 2021 Denis Villeneuve's Dune this is a perfect film. The only criticism I hear over and over and over again is that it is just like blue balls the movie because of the way it ends kind of at this midpoint in this story. But as soon as I saw how Denis Villeneuve decided to end it when I was sitting there in that auditorium, I looked to my wife and I said, I'm not worried. There's gonna be a second one. They're gonna tell this complete story. And thankfully in this point in time, we know that it is for sure coming and it's supposed to be here next year. But Dune is an epic film and I love Denis Villeneuve. I think he's one of the greatest directors we have making movies today. I really loved Blade Runner 2049. I love Prisoners, Sicario. He's truly one of the greats. And not having read the Dune books, I went into this movie with a completely open mind. I didn't know anything about the story or the characters, and I left the movie wanting more. And I think that's exactly what it was supposed to do. It was supposed to make you want the other half of the story. The visual effects, the sound mixing, the storytelling, the acting, the score from Hans Zimmer, just everything. Everything about this movie is 10 out of 10. This world felt real. And some of the younger viewers might not understand just how hard some other filmmakers have tried to tell this story. David Lynch made a Dune movie that is just a complete shit show of a movie and super weird, not in a good way. And there's also a documentary about somebody who tried to make it back in the 70s, I think. And that's another reason why this movie is interesting because I heard a lot of people say that this was a ripoff of Star Wars. Well, listen up. Dune, the book, is considered the first sci-fi epic novel like ever and not only that when they tried to make that first film back in the 70s they built some of the sets and the movie ended up not going into production so they took those sets and they used them in movies like 
Star Wars, Alien, and a couple others that I can't think of at the top of my head. So if you're one of those people who say, oh, it's just a ripoff of Star Wars, it's literally the other way around. Dune as a story has influenced sci-fi and the movies we have today in ways that like people don't even know. And the fact that Denis Villeneuve was able to pull off this movie and tell such a strange, complex Game of Thrones in space type story in a way that could bring people who have never even heard of Dune before up to speed and basically set up a franchise that HBO is already getting underway just goes to show how great of a filmmaker Denis Villeneuve is and how far special effects and filmmaking has come as a whole. Mark my words, Dune is historical. This movie is going to be remembered forever. And when that second one comes out, I think that's going to be solidified even more. Now, there is a slight chance that the second one's not going to be as good as the first one, but from what my friends who have read the books have told me, they set up the world and everything perfectly for that second half to have all the action and all the real craziness and the real epic storytelling to take place. And that's why Dune Part 2 is probably my most anticipated film of 2023. And I actually still need to get my physical copy of Dune on 4K Blu-ray. I don't buy a whole lot of Blu-rays anymore. And that one feels overdue at this point, so I need to order that. But there you have it! Those are my top 25 films of 2021. I don't know how long this video is going to end up being, but I'm looking at my camera right now and it says an hour and two minutes of footage. So this might be a long one. And so if you made it to the end of this video, I really appreciate it. Thank you for watching. And also comment the word movie, because if I go through the comments and see that you commented the word movie, I know that you watched the whole thing and you're a real one. Definitely stay tuned for some more movie lists like this. And of course, some more movie and TV show reviews. And as always, stay safe, be nice to each other out there, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace!